Number 10, the first reason, and we're going to try to go in a descending order. Top 10 reasons, working our way to the number one most important reason. The first reason, beginning at the beginning, that Jesus cannot be God. And the reason why we're going over this topic is because it's an issue of salvation. We want everyone to be saved. And this issue is a very important issue for Christians, Muslims, Jews, why Jesus cannot be God. And the first number one reason is that God cannot be born. God did not come into existence. He's always existed. He did not come into existence from non-existence. He was not born. He was not created. He has always been before there was even a thing called time. And we, as we all know, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born. He was born without a father. Yes, indeed, that was one of his true miracles. But he was indeed born. He was in the womb for nine months and he was born. So that by its very nature shows that he does not have the same quality and characteristics that God has. God cannot be born. Jesus was born. So those two people cannot be one and the same. Now, God, when he speaks of things, when he talks of his own characteristics and who he is, he is very, very explicit. For instance, in, in Isaiah 46 and 9, G, uh, God says that I am God and then there, no, there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. You, uh, also, the verses that Jesus quoted, he said, Hear, O Israel, which is one that is quoted in the Jewish synagogues every, uh, every time they have service. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is but one God, and then there is none else. And we all know the verses. You can go through the Old Testament and read about God's characteristics when he describes himself. It is always explicit. Now, there are some verses in the New Testament which can be implicitly interpreted as Jesus having claimed some type of divinity. But if that was such a big characteristic, if it was such a big deal that Jesus was God, if this was the way to salvation, that he was God in the flesh, come to sacrifice himself for the sins of humanity, then that is something God would have been explicit about because it is an issue of salvation. God does not beat around the bush about these type of issues when it comes to who he is. He is very clear with the children of Israel. I am God. There is none like me. Do not worship anything else. Period. And Jesus came and quoted the same very verses. So if it would have been an issue of salvation that he was God, he would have very clearly stated, I am God. I am God. He would not have told the, the Jews when they said that you call yourself God. He said, you say that I am. He would have very clearly said, yes, I'm God. And I'm here to save you from your sins. He never stated that in anywhere and it's never referenced in any scriptural text of any religion whatsoever. So therefore, if God is so explicit about his nature, why when it comes to him becoming a man, why did he not explicitly state so? The Bible says by God's own word that no one has ever seen God at any time. This is very clear. In John 1 18, it says no man has seen God at any time. In 1 John, no man has seen God at any time. Even Jesus' own statement in John 5 and 37, Jesus says, And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me, and you have neither heard his voice nor seen his face at any time. And Jesus was standing right there amongst them. So had he been God, why would he say you have never seen God at any time? You understand? This is yeah. what I'm talking about. This is clear cut. You have never seen God. If he would have been God, he would have said, you're looking at God right now. You want to see God? Look at me. You have seen him. And there are some verses in the Bible someone can reiterate and say, okay, we said anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. You know, if you've seen the Father, then you, if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. Or, you know, I and the Father are one. You know, and when you, but if you read the context of those verses, rather than just taking a sentence out, if you read the context of four or five different verses, you will see that he was speaking of being one in purpose. Even in the one where he said, I and the Father are one, he was speaking about just as no one can pluck the children of God out of God's hand, yeah. no one can pluck them out of my hand because I and I, Father, are one. Meaning that we are one in purpose. We have the same exact mission. I am coming as God's message bearer to humanity. We are one and the same in, in what we want from you. I am God's representative. Anything that he wants is my will. So if you understand them in that light explicitly, then you will understand that Jesus said, no man have seen God at any time. And this is also in the Quran. Moses asked to see God in the Quran. And he said, look at the mountain. If the mountain can see me, then you, if can bear my, my sight, then you can see me. And we know that when God showed himself to the mountain, it crumbled into pieces. And then Moses repented and said, I'm sorry. God is not something that can come in a form of a human being. I mean, you cannot contain God's essence inside of a physical form. That is to lessen God beyond extent, to put him inside of a physical form. He's too great to be put in any form, in any dynamiters, in any parameters, in any dimensions, any box. You can't put God inside a box. This concept was not taught by Jesus or his disciples, nor was it believed in by his followers and the, uh, the early followers of Christianity. As we see when, when they found the Dead Sea Skulls in Qumran, 
we see that the early Christians were still a part of Judaism. For instance, when, if you read the book of Acts, when Jesus Christ had, had, had departed from this earth, the, the disciples still uh, daily attended the synagogue. They still daily went to the temple at Jerusalem and worshiped as the Jews worship because this is what Jesus Christ brought. He brought the renewal of the laws of Moses. So if the disciples were running around teaching people that Jesus was God, they would have been banished out of the temple the day they walked in or they would have started their own church. But no, neither did Jesus. Jesus went to the temple himself. He did not build his own church anywhere and say, worship me. He went to the temple and worshiped God in the same way that Moses worshiped God, the same way that Abraham worshiped God, the same way that David worshiped God, the same way that Zechariah worshiped God. You know, he did the exact same thing and his disciples followed him. And if you look at the first second century Christians, they did the same thing. The, 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 the people of Qumran, the first disciple who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were also a part of Judaism. They considered themselves Judaism, uh, uh, practicing Jews mm -hmm. who followed Jesus as their prophet. So we see that nothing had changed. This whole concept of Trinity did not come about until the third century of the church and it was not formulated as a doctrine that must be believed in until 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea when um, all of the bishops and the, and, the, and the scholars of Christianity which started to form into Christianity after Paul came together and said, okay, this is a doctrine that we must believe in. And the first person to expound this doctrine was Paul, who never saw Jesus Christ himself, never walked with him, never talked to him, never saw him, never ate with him, never learned from him. It was something that he formulated off a of vision that he said he had while he was on the road to Damascus to actually persecute Christians. So this he was the first person to ever come up with this title of Christian, ever come up with this title of Trinity, ever come up with the Godship of Jesus Christ or Only Begotten Son. All of these things came with Paul the Apostle. Jesus ate, slept, and prayed. He ate, slept, and prayed. And we know God by His very nature is self-sufficient. He does not need anything to continue His existence. God does not need to eat. God does not need to sleep. God does not need to pray. God is not in need of anything because if he was in need of something, then he would not be God. He would need something else other than himself to exist. That would therefore would not make him, that would take away his Godship. And we know that Jesus Christ was born. We know that he ate. We know that he slept and we know that he prayed. Had he not ate, slept or drank any water, he would have died. Therefore, he was not self-sufficient. He needed something to continue his existence. Therefore, by his very nature of not being self-sufficient and God being self-sufficient, those two things can't mix. You can't be self-sufficient and not self-sufficient all at the same time. And then Jesus prayed. He was in need of prayer. Anytime he had an issue, he would pray. He would tell the disciples, I need to go pray. Wait here while I pray. Wait here while I pray. He would go to the temple, pray, prostrating on his face on the ground. This in his very nature showed that he was in need of something greater than himself because that is the essence of prayer. It's showing that you're in need of someone who is greater than you. Even people who worship idols, they believe that idol is greater than them, therefore they pray to it. So if Jesus was God, who why was the need of his prayer? He would have been telling people to pray to him. You need, my, you need to pray to me. I don't need to pray to anyone. So therefore by his very nature of necessity of him being in need of something else, he cannot be God. Number five reason is that Jesus claimed that God's knowledge was greater than his. When he was asked about the hour, the day of judgment, he said, of that day knoweth no man, nor the angels in heaven, nor, 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 nor the, the, the son, but only the father has knowledge of that hour. So if he would have been God, he would have known that. How could God, if the Trinity was indeed true and God was God, Jesus was God, the Holy Spirit was God, they're all the same person. That means that how does one not know the same information that the other one knows if they are the same person? If God knows the hour, Jesus should know the hour. The Holy Spirit should know the hour. They should have all known that thing. But even Jesus said in another verse in John 14, 28, he said, the father is greater than I. He admitted the father is greater than I. So if they are equals, how can one be greater than the other? If they are both indeed God, how could one be greater than the other? So showing that Jesus did not have the exact same knowledge that God has, how could he be God? You see, these are statements that are very explicit. And if you weigh all of these statements against the ambiguous ones, which ones are going to weigh out more? Point blank, explicit, to the point statements or statements that can be interpreted this way, that way by anyone who walks and wants to give them an interpretation. These cannot be interpreted any other way than Jesus was not God. He was something less than God. 
Number four is that Jesus explicitly states that he is not God. Now we think that Jesus implicitly states that he is God. There are some ambiguous verses, but what about where he explicitly states that he is not God? For instance, in John 17 and three, he said, and this is life eternal. This is the way to eternal life that they may know you, the one true God, one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent as a messenger. He said, this is the, in a nutshell, what I have come to teach, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And anyone who is a Muslim, that statement makes very, very, very good sense because it's even a part of our faith where you would say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah wa Isa Rasulullah, which means that there is no God but one God. Muhammad is his messenger and Jesus is his messenger, which means they are ones who were sent. And that's the tenet of our faith, to believe in the one true God and Jesus Christ who was sent. Very simple, very explicit. And then also he told, uh, when after he was uh, in, in the Bible, when he ascended to God, he told, he told them, he said, Jesus saith unto her, he's speaking to Mary Magdalene, I ascend unto my father and your father, my God and your God. He very clearly equated her God and his God as being the one and same God. He didn't say, I'm going to ascend to myself and to your God and to me. You know, these, this, this doesn't make any sense. If even if somebody would have said that, you'd have, this man is a fool and a half. If he's saying, I'm gonna ascend into myself. Your God is me and I'm going to myself and you know, all of these things are not, but he very, very clearly stated, the one true God and I am ascending to my God and your God. Point blank clear, those things can't get any more simple. Number three is that even when you get to the title, Son of God, even when you get the title only begotten Son of God, this is not an exclusive title to Jesus Christ, which many people think. There are many, 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 many instances where the word Son of God is used. And if anyone would study Jewish culture, especially ancient Jewish culture or Orthodox Jewish culture, to be called a Son of God is, is a title of esteem and a title of prestige and honor, even being called Lord. Someone would come to their rabbi and they would refer to him as my Lord. This is something that is known by, West, uh, by Eastern Europeans also. They refer to people as Lord. So this title is not exclusive. And Jacob and Solomon in Exodus are called sons of God. Ephraim and Jeremiah, Adam is called son of God in the New Testament. Common people are called sons of God in the New and Old Testament. So these are not something that is an exclusive title as son of God. And I had a, I had a discussion with a uh, pastor about this. He said, yes, but Jesus was the only begotten son of God. And I said, okay, what gives him that exclusive title? What is the characteristic that gives him that exclusive title? He says the New Testament says that, yes, but there must be a reason why he has this exclusive title. He says, because he was born miraculously without a father. And in, and in Jewish culture, your lineage was from your father's side. You know, you, you, would, you would be the son of your father, of his father. That's how your lineage was traced, not through the mother. So therefore, since his lineage stopped in Mary, he had no father, therefore God must be his father. I said, okay, that makes sense. That would make sense to an average human being. I said, but if that is the characteristic for his exclusive sonship, that he has no father, I said, what about Adam and Eve? They had no father nor mother. They were fashioned, as God says, by his own hands out of dirt. So if anyone has the exclusive title to be the only begotten son of God, it should have been Adam. Because not only was he not have a father or mother, he was the first creation. Therefore, why does he not have that title? Why are we not worshiping him as the exclusive son of God? And he had no answer to that. And it was not to bash him. It was just to say that this is not an exclusive to say, oh, because he has no father, he is God's exclusive son. This was the extreme miracle that was exclusive one of the exclusive things for the children of Israel to Jesus about Jesus Christ was that he had no father he had no father at all he came directly from a virgin who had never touched another human being and that was his miracle that was if you read the Quran and explains it very clearly when Mary brought the child they they accused her of adultery but the miracle was was that God made Jesus speak he, he made him speak as a baby and said that I am the messenger of God 
Don't, are, you, are you surprised that God can do this? God can do anything. That's why Jesus was giving more miracles than almost any other prophet. He was giving physical miracles to soften the deadened heart of the children of Israel at that time. That's why he was given such great miracles to heal the blind, to heal the sick, to bring people back to, to, to life from the dead, being born of a virgin. All of this was because this was one of God's last messages. He was the next to last messenger to be sent to the children of Israel and they rejected him. That's when God decided to send Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a mercy to all the worlds. Because we even know that Jesus was not sent to all the world. He was sent to the Jews. Even in his own statements, he said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He is not a prophet for everyone. He was a prophet that was exclusively for their people, as was every prophet before him. Every nation was sent a messenger. Children of Israel sent more than anyone. But finally, God decided to send one for the blanket of humanity, and that was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who even said that Jesus Christ spoke of him. God cannot change. In Malachi, God himself, this is an explicit statement that is directly attributed to God. Whether it's from God or not, who knows, but this is a statement that is attributed directly to God. God says, I do not change, therefore the sons of Jacob are not consumed. He was stating that I do not change in my nature. I don't be happy one day, sad the other day, angry the next day. I, I, I don't. His nature does not change. Therefore, God cannot be subjected to the same laws which he created. For instance, God created time. Therefore, he cannot be subjected to time. He does not pass through time. He doesn't get old. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't get sleepy. He doesn't go through the same stages of time that we go through. He created air. Therefore, he doesn't need it. He created the sun, therefore he doesn't need his warmth, he doesn't get hot, he doesn't get cold. These things do not happen to God. God cannot put himself into a human body, come on this earth, be subjected to time, be subjected to, to hunger, be subjected to, to tiredness, be subjected to being whipped and beat and hurt. These are things that God cannot, by his very nature, be. Some people say, you know, uh, that God can do anything. And that is not a correct statement. Because there's, God can do anything that is permeant to his nature. For instance, God cannot go to hell. God cannot die. God wasn't born. God doesn't eat. There are certain things he cannot do because it would be against his nature. It would be against his Godship. It would make him less than God. So God can do anything except that which would make him less than God. Anything that is, and that's why in Islam he has attributes. Clearly laid out attributes which get, keep him as the title of God. Any attribute that can be attributed to human beings is something that cannot be attributed to God. But things that are attributed to God, like mercy, can be attributed to us. But anything that is attributed to us cannot be attributed to God because it would make him less than God. The most essential reason why Jesus cannot be God is that God is the essence of worship. God is the object of worship. God is the person whom we worship. No matter what religion you follow, whoever they call God, is their object of worship. It's who they give their devotion to, it's who they make their prayers to, it's who they make their sacrifices to, it's who they pay their charity in the name of, God. Whatever God they call it, whether, you know, whether they call it Krishna, whether they call it Buddha, whatever is their God, that's who they give their worship to. So had Jesus been God, he would have told people to worship him. And, but in fact, in Matthew 15 and 18, he did the exact opposite. He told people, in vain shall you worship me. Predicting the future, in vain shall you worship me and teach as doctrine the commandments of men. Not of me, not of God. You will teach as doctrine the commandments of men. That means you will teach as doctrine the commandments of the Trinity, which come from man. You will teach as doctrines that I am God, which will come from men. You will teach in doctrines that throw away the law of Moses and the law of God, which will come from men. But the worship you give to me shall be in vain. And we all know what the word vain means. It will not count for anything. We will go before God on the day of judgment, having worshipped Jesus 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And on the day of judgment, Jesus will deny those people. It is already stated when God asked Jesus in the Quran on the day of judgment, did you command anyone to worship me? And Jesus will say, no, you know I would not do anything except for what you told me to. And all of these prayers and everything that is being made to Jesus are in vain because he does not hear these things because he is not an object of worship. He is not an object of worship, and therefore we are being tricked. It is a trick that has come about upon us, and, and, and unfortunately, to be harsh, it is a trick that has come from the one who is the author of tricks, who is the devil. And he's already said in the Quran that he will get people to worship 
him falsely. He will get people to worship idols falsely. He will get people to worship these things falsely. And then on the day of judgment, he will leave you. He will say, I tricked you. Now I'm free from you. I already got you. I'm gone. I'm out. I have nothing to do with you because I already got you to do what I wanted you to do for so long. Now it means nothing. It will be just like dust. All these piles of prayers and sacrifices you've made will be just like a blast of wind will come and just blow them into dust. They will be worth nothing. So Jesus himself said, do not worship me. Even when someone came to him and said, good master. He said, why you call me good master? There's none good but one that's God. Or they came and called him master. He said, why do you call me master and you don't do my father's works? You know, he always denied that worship. When anyone would ever try to worship him, he would deny it. Some people may have called him Lord and they said he didn't rebuke him because it's his title of respect. But no one ever gave a devout worship to Jesus without him rejecting. Mm -hmm.